this is uh, the first ever Silicon Valley Google TV hackathon. Um, we've already had the first evening yesterday, so today most people are already busy hacking. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the technical ins and outs and maybe some of the tips and tricks you may not have come across. So if you get any cool ideas for new apps, um, that would be awesome. I am, I am Christian Kurtzke. I am a developer advocate with the Google TV team here at Google. And we actually have uh, the London uh, hackathon also tuned in, so it's uh, evening there. Those guys already are an entire day of hacking ahead of us. All of you should by now be familiar with our developers.google.com slash TV page. So that's uh, where you can get um, all the TV specific uh, answers for you know some API documentation and sample code. There's a bunch of links to samples. Um, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation specifically is about user interface and user interaction design. And it's probably too late for you now, but when you get home, read about the Google TV Android patterns. It's a pretty lengthy document. The, the Android pattern document, it's basically what our user interface designers have come up with after you know, about a year of Google TV out in the field, best practices. When we launched Google TV version 1 initially, there was a lot of feedback that the product is a little bit difficult to use in the living room, that it doesn't quite have the same feel as your typical living room TV devices. It was a little bit too much Android. So what the guys have done is they have come up with best practices how to create Android apps that actually look really great on a Google television. And I'll give you the highlights of the document. So. You all are coders. I think I saw a couple of UI designers yesterday. I hope we didn't scare them all away. I hope they're still here. Um, usually coders, they're like, why on earth would I care about user interface? That's what I do all the way at the end, once I have my cool code. But um, keep in mind that your user interface, just by its nature, is what the users see and interact with every day. Uh, the better UI leads to a better perceived quality. Um, I actually really think that it's, it's not as much as like, you know, making your app twice or three times as good, but a great app with a crappy UI is definitely not as attractive as an average app with a really, really polished, amazing UI. So perceived quality is really something you should keep in mind uh, when you design your code. Uh, if, for example, you have thumbnails loading and you have, you know, 25 or 200 thumbnails loading for an album, and they all trickle in one after another, it's not as impressive as if you maybe preload them, pre-cache them. Uh, also keep in mind, when you, um, when you do UI stuff, very often you can anticipate what the user wants to do. If you have a slideshow, you go to the next slide. Maybe don't wait until the user hits the left arrow key to go to the next slide. I mean, maybe load the slide while the user is already looking at the current slide. So when they go to the next slide, there's really no delay. It goes immediately to the next slide. So there are a few tricks where you can really improve the value of, of your application quite easily. So better perceived quality gets you better ratings. Better ratings, of course, in the Android market or Google Play. Better rating gives you a lot better app ranking, and everybody likes better app ranking because that gets you on top of the list and you get more installs, more purchases, and ultimately more profit. So I don't want to say that in order to be a great Google TV app, you need to have amazing UI designers. But if I had a choice of putting together a team, I would make sure that at least one of the guys on my team has experience with UI design. It really helps a lot. Source, let's check out. So a couple things that I'm going to talk about is input devices, some guidelines, left side navigation, all the goodies. So all of you already have a Google TV device on your desk right now. You're developing with one. So the Logitech device that you have right now the input device, it looks a lot more like a keyboard. It's not as much a typical home device. 
So on this slide here, you see the designs for the next generation Google TV uh, control devices. One thing that they all have in common is they all have what we call a D-pad. It's the up, down, left, right, familiar navigation uh, scheme. If you have ever used a television, you have used a D-pad. Most users, when you give them a remote, a remote control, the first thing they want to do is flip channels up, down, left, right. So we can pretty much say that D-pads is really the most familiar user interface. Um, use it. So in your app, we know that on an Android app, if you have a tablet app, if you have a phone app, you will use touch input, you will use swipe gestures, you will use pinch, zoom, whatever gestures, awesome. But if you only have a D-pad, think about how a user will use your application with just up, down, left, right. And a lot of people, they start with a touch-based app, and then they sort of try to fit the square peg into a round hole and add D-pad design later. I really think in order to get this right, you have either you're incredibly lucky and your app just works, or you have to seriously rethink the way you lay out your, your user interface. Um, a lot of people tell me this is incredibly difficult. I only have basically five keys. How am I going to make this work? Um, well, that's the art of making a usable design for a living room. And I thought this was really hard until somebody reminded me that, for example, I just bought one of those fancy little thermostats for my wall. The user interface is a dial. I can turn left, I can turn right, and I can select. So it's, that's only three choices. And they made an entire user, user interface with it. I can program schedules and everything. So it's really about how you structure the UI. Then all those devices also have some form of a pointing device. Some of them have a uh, touchpad. Um, you have on your Logitech, you have a little touchpad. Some of them, the LG in the middle, it actually has sort of a virtual mouse pointer. Just imagine it like a virtual laser pointer you can point at your TV. Um, my advice is when the user reaches for the mouse pointer, they are usually already upset. So make it easy. Um, make use of the D-pad. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you just need a mouse key. And the most common feature for that or the most prominent use case is imagine you have a map and you want to click on a map. Clicking on a map with a D-pad is an incredibly painful experience. Um, your users will appreciate if they can use the mouse for that. But use the mouse consciously and use it sparingly. Um, the other input devices we have is we do have a uh, remote control app. So if you have a smartphone, iPhone, or Android phone, you can download our, uh, it's called an Animote uh, app. You can use it. We also open source the Animote protocol. So if you go to our code.google.com slash TV slash remote uh, repository, um, we have the communication library and the app for Android open source. And one of the guys who actually picked it up, um, Leon, he built uh, the Able Remote application on top of this. And he did an amazing job. I mean, we ours is really just proof of concept. It's like, okay, here, you can actually do that, right? But Leon took it to a whole nother level, and he did an amazing app based on this. So. If you want to do something that interacts with the TV, I can encourage you just check out the library and see if you can use it. In, in general, I think multi-screen applications are a really great experience. Um, I don't think you will today have enough time to write not one but two applications. Let's see. I have a phone call. Not important. So, um, yeah, in the, in the future, keep in mind how maybe your app can be extended across multiple devices. So maybe you can write an app which synchronizes data across TV and across your tablet. Or maybe you can um, have an app where, say, one, one concrete example is we have a poker game where participants, uh, they synchronize their smartphone with the television, and then they have the uh, game pieces, the cards, on their smartphone, and they have a playing field, basically the table they can deal to and the table where the cards get uh, dealt. 
uh, that's on the television. So use the television as sort of a shared social environment. So let's talk about things people want to do on television. And I'm just going to very briefly talk about this because this is uh, sort of the high-level questions that I get. There is exactly four questions that I usually get from developers. I have not gotten the fourth ones. I haven't put it on there yet. Uh, the fourth one is, is there NDK? No, there is no NDK. Um, so I'm taking that out of uh, the slides. This is about user experience. So a lot of people want to create a better program guide because everybody is frustrated with their current cable box program guide. Um, some people want to overlay IMs or overlay, just in general, overlay their app on top of the current live television. And then other people want to embed live television in your app. So that's basically the three typical use cases that people always see when, you know, when they see Google TV the first time. Um, I'm sorry. I'm here to crush your dreams. <laughs> so you can't overlay on live television, at least not easily. Um, you also can't really um, integrate live television in your app. And you can't, you can't actually access the, um, the program guide information. Uh, if you have any further questions, I really encourage you to read. If you are a developer in the TV space, you should be very familiar with uh, the HDCP specification. It's the um, high definition content protection specification. So I would encourage you to start at Wikipedia. There's a bunch of really great links and you can follow them they have a lot of really cool material. So there is a lot of <coughs> complex topics. It's not that I'm, you know, it's not that I like to spoil fun here, but um, check out HDCP. Um, if you have other requests, cool ideas that you want to do, things like you know positioning TV inside your app, I encourage you to go to our issue tracker, file a feature request. I, I bring the features or I bring the requests back to our program. Uh, program management and to our product teams. The more feedback they get from developers, the better. If you have a concrete example of what you would like to do, and you can say, oh my god, if I had this one API, I could be the next, I don't know, $2 million or no, $2 billion startup, uh, chances are they'll listen. So now that I've gotten out of the way all the things you can't do, let me tell you what you actually can do. And there's a lot of exciting stuff left. So the first thing that it's, it also falls in the category of, uh, well, can, cannot do. So Google TV does not have a GPS, which makes a whole lot of sense because driving directions on your TV are really boring. It doesn't go very far and it doesn't go very fast. Um, but what you can do is you can read out the zip code where you're in. Um, it's an interesting feature if you do things like local news, local weather, um, I don't know, personalized horoscope by zip code, stuff like that. So if you want to know where the TV is, when you, when you all set up your television yesterday, um, it at some point or other asks you about a zip code, and you enter the zip code. What we do is internally we store the zip code as a location, and you can actually uh, query the zip code through the location provider. So if you are familiar with location providers, you know how to get location based on GPS, based on other features. You can uh, just use the location provider named static. So that's one feature that's, that's different on Google TV. Another feature, and this goes back to the EPG guide. So a lot of people want, as they want to create something like a program guide. Um, we, there is no API on Google TV right now that tells you, A, what the user is currently watching, and it, there is no API that tells you what show is on, on which channel. So you can't say, okay, what's currently playing on ABC? Is it Friends? Is it the news? Whatever. What we can do is you can have a permission to read the channel lineup. And this is, uh, for our friends in the UK right now, this is very US-centric. So this uh, API is, works on Google TV in the US right now when we roll out to Europe. There may be subtle changes, like things like the channel number may be different, call sign, 
Um, so this is one of the areas that will is subject to localization. But if you write an app for Google TV in the U.S., what you can do today is you can get a, uh, you can get a content provider, and I put the content provider name on here. It's conveniently com Google Android TV provider slash channel listing, and it gives you basically uh, it gives you a list of information that allows you to identify which channels are available. As you guys all know, probably no two people in this building have the same lineup of channels. Somebody has the movie package, somebody has the special sports package, other people have whatever, weird international packages. So this gives your app at least a chance to know which channels are available. And the nice thing is the last field here is called the TV URI. If you send an intent with that URI, it will actually change channel to that channel. So the use case is maybe you have an app, your app has something like turn to Bloomberg TV. First of all, you can figure out if they have Bloomberg or CNN. And then once you've figured that out, you can just send the intent and it tunes to that particular channel. So the other use case that I mentioned was, okay, you want to overlay on top of live television. Again, there is no official API for that. But it wouldn't be a hackathon if we wouldn't be all really creative Android hackers here. So let's assume you want to overlay on live television. Well, a convenient Android method is Android Toasts. So if you have, I assume you all are familiar with activities and services and all kinds of stuff. But if you have a background service that sends out a toast, then uh, keep in mind your toast can have a generic view. You can define whatever view you want. Um, keep in mind that, um, actually it's not toast set background color, it's actually view dot set background color. So in your view you can set a background color and transparent is a valid color. And you can set the toast duration. So if you put those three together you might figure out how to do something interesting. Um, you want to embed TV in your view? I know there is a bunch of people who posted like various workarounds how to do it. My advice is please don't do it, not because I'm a horrible person, but it will break and you will have a lot of work doing it again and um, just don't embed TV in your application. So, okay, with that, let's talk about general UI guidelines. So basically what, what we're telling you is um, create an Android app, make it pretty, don't, I mean, you can interact somewhat with the television. Um, as I said, the overlaying is a little bit shaky. There is a bunch of apps who do it uh, successfully right now. There is, uh, for example, this um, thing is called Twitter for Google TV or Socialize Twitter. So those guys do a little Twitter, uh, incoming Twitter stream on the bottom. It's, it's okay. It's the user experience sometimes a little bit tricky, how you get back, how you change which Twitter channel you're listening to. So I would say don't make this the focus, the key focus of your app. This is a nice sort of add-on feature. Focus really on having a useful app that user enjoys using when they're in their living room. So the way we see it is in the living room, 10-foot UI, people want to consume content. They've had a rough day at work. They've spent, I don't know, eight, 12 hours staring at a monitor with small text. Last thing they need is more small text. So they want to have entertainment. They want to consume content. Um, one of the examples is, for, uh, for example, for YouTube, we had a YouTube player and you would enter what YouTube clip you want to play back. You play it back and then it stops and then it waits. That's a bad experience. That's okay for your desktop, but on your um, on your living room TV, you just want to keep playing content continuously. Um, keep in mind also, it's sort of a mix between computer and TV, but definitely more on the TV side. The Google TV has usually high quality sound connected to it. And keep the navigation simple and very visual. So basically, what what our advice is, don't use bright white backgrounds. Uh, unlike a conference room, 
your living room is usually dark, it's in the evening, um, you're usually, if you look at TV UIs, it's always more muted background colors. Um, simplify your navigation. The other thing we're going to talk a little bit more about later is the difference between focus and selection, and you should, um, you should be clear and predictable for this. And animations are always good. So a little anecdote for this. When we did the um, application with Discovery Channel, um, so Discovery Channel had a little app. What they did is it's a world map, and people would actually um, have video clips around the world. And so you can click on the world map, and it looks kind of neat stuff. And one of their designers came up with the idea of let's just have not just a static map, but have actually an animated cloud floating over the world map. And it made a huge difference. It actually looked a whole lot better. Unfortunately, it also ate up all of our CPU, and it almost brings the TV to a standstill. But um, it looked really awesome. So when you when you have UIs, think about where you can maybe add some value with animations. People usually expect stuff to move around their television. A lot of people, when things stop moving around on television, uh, they assume something's broken. So overall. Yes, it's Android, and yes, it's Android on a big screen, but it's not just Android on a big screen. There's a couple special things to keep in mind. Um, as I said, focus on what's important. Um, throw out the non-essential. Our friends over in Cupertino do that incredibly well. Um, you can learn a lesson or two from just keeping it really, really simple. If, if you have three buttons on the screen, think how you can get rid of at least one of them. Um, the other thing is people including myself, really don't like scrolling on their television. Um, scrolling is unnatural. It's on, on desktops, people have a scroll wheel, they understand how to scroll. On a TV, it's much better to go from page to page and just have multiple views instead of scrolling. The nine patch images is, they have been around since the beginning of Android but they're still underappreciated. And a lot of people, what they do is they have menu buttons with pre-rendered text on it. It's, it's okay, it looks good. You may get those from your graphics designer. Um, educate your graphic designer about nine patches. It makes a huge difference in terms of how it looks, especially when it scales. You really don't want to scale pre-rendered buttons with text on it. And it also saves you a ton of memory, especially as we have seen yesterday, Google TV devices, they are very high resolution devices, there's a lot of pixels on that screen in front of you. Um, having buttons, or having a large number of buttons individually pre-rendered with text is just a waste of memory, a waste of storage. Have a simple mental model, make it easy for people to remember where they are, and consider hiring a professional designer. I am not a professional designer, and as I like to point out, if your app looks anywhere nearly like my slides, you're doing it wrong. And here's the test. Does anybody remember what I just said? See? <laughs> I don't either. So, keep it simple. Have visual effects, basically dark background, bold fonts, short lines, increased line spacing. You should have about that much information on a TV screen. If you have any more characters on a TV screen, people are getting frustrated. Um, the other topic I want to talk a little bit about is social device, multiple users. I know where my phone is at all times. I get really nervous when I'm without my phone. I'm getting even more nervous when other people are using my phone. Um, the opposite is really true with my television. I have frequently no idea who the hell is at home using my TV at any given time. My wife might have some friends over, they might be watching some shows that I'm really not interested in. Um, if there is an email coming in and there is an email notification showing up while they're watching their show, they are anywhere from annoyed to upset. So think about how you deal with multiple users using your application, and think about how you protect privacy. Um, it may not always be the best idea to have your browsing history available for everyone in your web browser. You may have friends come over, you may have kids come over. Um, let's see, important issues, no touch. So no matter how people try to create no touch applications on a tablet, they will always somehow rely on touch. And I'll give a few examples 
in a second later. So be very clear and conscious about the use of the D-pad. Uh, keep in mind you're designing for a landscape device. It's, I know it's sometimes not obvious, but televisions are landscape. Even when you're laying down on your couch, they're still landscape. And I don't know why I put this on this slide, but uh, just as a reminder, I already had the question yesterday once. Um, flash does not work in our web views. So that's some of the important issues. Back to how much stuff should I put on a slide? Or how much stuff should I put on a TV screen? Uh, if in doubt, put less. Um, having empty space, white space, is a great design element. Every designer will attest to that. Um, if I look at how much information I can pack on a screen, I I visualize sort of this curve here where a tablet is really most of the information. Very few people will read an ebook on a television. And there is people who will read ebooks on television. There is, uh, it's usually for the visual impaired. It's great if you have large font and everything. But keep in mind, um, people want to, a tablet, they hold it close. It's about a foot away or two feet away. You have very close interaction. They are used to reading lots and lots of text on a tablet. People are not used to reading paragraphs and paragraphs of information on a TV screen. I've touched on memory consumption a few times. Um, picture this, it's, it's actually worse than you think. When you double the resolution, keep in mind you quadruple the amount of memory. So if you go from a smartphone to a tablet, you go from 1.5 megabytes to 4 megabytes. If you go from a tablet to a 1080p television, you go from 4 megabytes per screen to 8 megabytes per screen. This is one of the reasons why 9 patches are a really good idea. You want to keep your memory consumption sort of in check. So, here is so this, this is a couple, this is a little excursion into a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, if you look at a TV, or if you look at a UI, this is a UI that looks very much like your average desktop application. It has icons on the side, it has text on top, and it has a bunch of uh, images next to it. You will notice, if, what I always say is, um, to design a proper Google TV application, um, watch a lot of television. See how other people do this on TV. There is people who live and breathe TV UIs. They, they do this every day. It's a full-time job for them. Um, UIs on TV rarely look like that. And this is an actual UI, so this is one of our apps. But usually um, when people design for television, they know about the concept of safe areas and overscan and like stuff that you can't see. So keep in mind, televisions don't always display all of the pixels all the time. Especially when you have, for example, something like a Blu-ray player or the Logitech review that you have in front of you. When you connect those to a television, it does not always know which brand of television is on the other side of the cable. And it may, this, this particular brand of television, it may have been on sale over at Costco a couple months ago, and it may not display all pixels. And it's not a matter of, I want to say it's not necessarily a matter of price, it's, it's more a matter of the manufacturer. Some manufacturers have some, I don't know, chrome bezels or something. So what TV, basically everybody who is in the broadcast business, what they tell you is expect the worst and expect that about 10% of the image are not vis visible. So that would mean if you have a UI the way I just showed it to you, you would actually not see a bunch of stuff on the screen. So this is generic TV. This has nothing to do with Google TV. So on Google TV, the world is a little bit different. So the overscan actually doesn't look like this. So we try to make your life a little bit easier. Basically what we do is we, we at, at least after you set up the Google TV device and you calibrate for the overscan left and right, you can at least be assured that the top of your UI and the left side of your UI are visible. And basically when you do a full screen canvas, the full screen canvas will always be visible like this on, on the TV screen. What you do not know is, you do not know if the full screen canvas has exactly 1920 by 1080 pixels. It may have 
that many pixels or not. And after both Clint, East, Clint Eastwood, you feel lucky. So if you have an app, how many TVs will display it correctly? And from our experience, I want to say about 20% of TVs display the full pixels all the way to the end. And a significant number have about 5% that are missing. One example where this fails pretty spectacularly is going back to my little example. Picture you have a world map. This is an app where you have a world map. The way you've done this in Android is um, you have basically you have a JPEG image. You set it as a background. Um, you have a full screen canvas. You say you know set background, fill parent uh, horizontally and vertically. And then you render this little pointer thing on top of it, and you, you know exactly where it goes. It should point to, say, Miami. And you do the math, and you point to it exactly right there. Other use cases, say you program a chess game, you have the chess board as a background, and you put game pieces on top. Anytime you render a runtime on top of a full screen background. Now, if this runs on a smaller TV, and you don't have the full resolution, what happens is you set fill parent. Well, it will do exactly that. It will fill parent. It will scale the background to match the smaller TV, but you didn't take it into account when you did your little map marker, did you? So suddenly your map marker points somewhere, I don't know, it's either Costa Rica or Cuba or somewhere, but it's not Florida anymore. Um, similarly, if this was a tic-tac-toe game or if this was a um, uh, different app, you would suddenly point, you know, your, your game pieces would not be on the playing grid. So depending on what you do is you can either do the math and you can position correctly based on, you know, available X, available max Y, or you can do just cropping. So instead of fill parent, you can just use um, gravity top, gravity left, and then you just clip off whatever. Sorry for the guys in Australia, sometimes they lose. London will be there. So um, the other advantage for cropping that I want to highlight is, if I just go back quickly, if I go back to the scaling model, what happens here is um, Android reads in your bitmap. And let's assume you had a full screen JPEG. It decodes it to 1,980 by uh, 1,920 by 10 by 1,080. And then it figures out, oh, it's about 2% too big. So you've already 8 megabytes that you loaded your JPEG into. Now you're scaling it about 5%. Takes up another 8 megabytes. You've just wasted, or not wasted, but you've used 16 megabytes of RAM to draw your background. If you do that a couple times, and you have a couple stacked activities, you're running out of memory really fast. So the scaling can double your background memory, or can double memory required. If you do cropping, you actually don't do this. Um, if you know what you're doing and you're really good, you can do scaling, but please make sure you either recycle or dispose the bitmap that you use to load, because otherwise if you don't explicitly do that, it will stick around. Best way to solve the problem is just don't use any absolute positioning. Just have your UIs use all the usual Android mechanisms and just float them around and use things like relative positions. Just say, hey, you know, gravity left, gravity right, align. The way you should do Android development anyways. So I keep saying this is really nothing special because as an Android developer, for better or for worse, you are familiar with uh, different screen sizes. There's a lot of different phones out there. There's a lot of different tablets out there. Almost every one of them has a different screen size. If you, as a professional Android developer, if you don't know how to deal with different screen sizes, um, there's a, I mean, I'm serious, there's a lot of amazing talks out there. Go listen to some of the I.O. talks from Roman Nurek from last year. Um, we keep telling people, basically absolute layouts are very evil. Just do, a, do all your layouts and relative. It gives you the most flexibility. And if you do it right from the start, um, it's not a lot more work. If you if you actually go down the rat hole and you do absolute positioning, I'm doing it, it's, it's difficult. Was a question?
Did you check it out? Uh, it's built. So the question was, this is really very basic, and this is something that everybody will need to do. So there was a question from somebody who is uh, starting out as an Android developer. Is there basically templates, or is there available XML code that they can use? Um, I, so I don't know, if sort of, we don't have a necessarily a perfect drag and drop editor for that, but the Eclipse uh, Android development tools, they actually do a really good job if you use relative layouts and you just basically position things, you can, if you drag and drop in, they will do most likely the right thing. The problem is that people have the tendency to fickle around with it, and they're like, oh, I want this a little bit more to the left, and then instead of whatever, increasing the padding, suddenly they're like, oh, put this 450 pixels from the right. And then things start breaking. Instead of saying, put it 450 pixels from the right, just say, oh, align it underneath this element and keep 30% spacing here and something. I, I want to say it's, it's just good practices. And there is a lot of uh, good documents to read. This also is not rocket science for anyone who does um, web design because web browsers are never the same size. So it's really just people who come from a more PC mentality and they're like, okay, I have a full screen, 1280 by whatever, 1024, go use it. Uh, they usually are surprised and they're like, well, what do you mean? Suddenly it's a little bit shorter here and stuff. But yeah, it's, and there's, there's a lot of great examples. Um, we just last Friday published um, we used to have basically the blogs, which are a great resource for stuff. Um, we used to have sample codes, which is just a bunch of code. But uh, we started something called Android University, or Android U, and we published the first bunch of classes last Friday. And it's not necessarily Google TV specific, it's really just Android specific. And it's targeted, it's sort of a curriculum program where you can pick some lessons. And so we, it's usually an article and source code, and the article describes what we do in the source code, how to use the source code, but then you can just cut and paste from the source code into your own app. So that's a great resource. It's just on the standard Android uh, developers page. So if you look for Android U, um, you can find the first couple of classes, and we're, we're adding to it as we go. So that's gonna be our new sort of outreach. And then of course there's a ton of books about all this. So, one thing I want to just mention is about sound. Um, yes, I already said you know, it's usually connected to a great sound system. It's great for streaming music. Um, what you should keep in mind is um, sound focus. So Android has audio focus management. When you have an app which plays back a lot of audio, and it's something where audio is really the focus of your app, make sure that the audio is actually in the foreground, so you can request audio focus. And when you play audio in the background, say you are an MP3 player and the user starts it and then they do something else, maybe they read news, maybe they uh, go on and run another app. What I do very frequently, actually, I just use my Pandora player to play music and then I go and watch a slideshow in my slide application. Um, but when you do that, make sure that you as an app respect the audio focus as well. So this is a standard Android API. Um, mouse navigation, yeah, don't don't do it. Here's a couple more design. Uh, I want to say common sense tips is uh, and basically anticipate what the user wants to click next. Um, highlight or put focus on that element. So ideally, they just need to click once. So if you have, for example, three or four screens and you just go from screen to screen to screen. Maybe highlight the next button so they can just easily click on it. Um, also, make sure there is a way for users to go back. So Android and Google TV, we have the back key on our keyboard. So use the back key. And make sure you clean up your back stack so it makes sense for your application. Sometimes it makes sense to go back one step at a time. Other times, maybe when the user presses back, they want to go all the way to basically the home screen of your app. Um, yeah, 
another reminder. You, if your app does anything where search makes sense, um, have a search area on screen. I lost that battle with our UX designers, and now they make me put it on my slides. But um, I, I used to say that we have a search key on the keyboard. You don't need a search button in your app because everybody knows how to just press the search key on the keyboard. Well, what happens is when you when your users will interact with your app, their eyes are on the television. Their eyes are 10 feet across the room. Uh, if you're unlucky, they actually need reading glasses to just find the search key on your on the keyboard, and they will not have their reading glasses handy. I've sat in too many user trials where people just could not find the search key. So put a search icon on the screen. Um, having said icons, avoid abstract icons. I keep seeing this thing that reminds me vaguely of something of my childhood, which people refer to as a three and a quarter inch floppy disk. Um, I, can I can vaguely remember why this should be something for saving a document. Um, I can guarantee you that people who are basically half my age, they will not figure out how to save a document if there is something that looks square and looks like a floppy disk that they have maybe seen on TV before. So use icons that make sense. Use icons with a label. Um, as it limits scrolling, um, how does your content look like if it runs on a... 70 inch screen so uh, keep in mind use high resolution uh, assets and if you do scroll make sure there's a really clear indication again I've set a lot of user trials where people could never figure out that there's more on the screen they could never figure out how to get to the bottom <laughs> so I would say don't have navigation elements that scroll out of the screen if you have things like a next button it should not be below the fold um, just change your layout Here's a bunch of design patterns. So, one of the things that you know about is selection and focus in Android. Make sure when you design your user interface that there is some clear indication of what is currently selected. Different colors might be a good idea. And also make sure you have some form of an indication of things that are currently in focus. So this one here has a red border. It might actually be better to have even more visible highlight. When you do this, make sure you also define a state where it's highlighted basically for focus and selection at the same time. So the way you define this is in Android, you have, uh, like everything else, you have an XML file. And you can uh, define different drawables for different focus states. So. You have a drawable for focus selected, you have a drawable for focus focus, and make sure you have one where both focus and selected are true. The easiest way to navigate an app is if it's a grid. It goes back to the whole left, right, up, down, D-pad. Um, here's a little pop quiz, I did this yesterday, so you, the guys in Mountain View know the answer, but I'll do it again for the London guys. So this is a grid, this is a layout here, and focus is wherever my little star is. So now the user presses the down key, and the question is, what is supposed to happen at this point? And it goes back to the whole don't surprise your user. We don't want to be surprised in our living room. So the question is, okay, what should the app do? The obvious answer is, well, of course, it needs to highlight, or the focus highlight needs to move down to the next item in this grid here. Um, this is very obvious for humans. For Androids and other computers, this is maybe not so obvious. Um, if you wrote your layout one particular way, the assumption could be that, hey, you know, the next down element is actually this one all the way to the left side here, or right side of the audience, no, left, whatever. Um, yeah, so this could be one, this is one valid choice. It could also mean, okay, go to the next row, but start at the beginning. Both of those options qualify as uh, users are confused, users lose eye contact with the focus, and they don't know what to do. It takes them about 10 seconds to find the focus again. Where, out of those three choices, which are all perfectly valid choices for Android, where you actually end up when you press the down key depends a lot on how you wrote your XML file. If you stack your XML files one way versus another way, 
um, the automatic focus handling will do whatever it thinks is best. And in most cases, this is not what your user will expect. So if you have a scenario like this, if you have a navigation with a lot of elements, I really encourage you to, first of all, define what is the expected outcome. And once you've done that, explicitly hard code in your XML file where the focus goes from here. So each element should basically have a focus down, left, right, up, uh, forward, and so on. So this is really, I think this is really polish that your users will appreciate because they are really, they really appreciate when the focus is, has sort of a deterministic uh, characteristic. Bonus points if you get that right with scrolling lists. So one of the challenges that I've seen frequently is if you have two list views on the screen and both of them are scrolling in different directions, and then you switch between the two different scrolling areas, it gets tricky. So back to our, so this is basically from our UI designers here. This is one thing we, we recommend you to do is um, structure your UI sort of in, in zones. So we have a global, a contextual, and a detailed zone. And so we like to lay out things from left to right. It makes it easier for people to sort of read. Most people are used to read from left to right. Um, as you will notice, the action bar on tablets is usually on top. For us, it's on the left side. It's our left side global navigation bar. Here is an example of a good navigation pattern, and uh, this is this could be something like imagine on the left side you have your friends, your work friends, your I don't know school friends, your personal friends. In the middle you have a list of those set friends, and then all the way on the right you have buttons that you can click to in, you know, invite them to chat or send an email or something. So the way you would navigate this is you start with the focus on the left, you select one of your groups of friends, you, your focus moves to the middle, you scroll through the list, you select one or two of your friends, and you scroll to the right and you can send an email. That's easily doable. Unfortunately, a lot of apps, especially when you develop them for tablets, will look something like that. And just to contrast, the difference is really just the layout. It's the same elements stacked horizontally versus vertical. So the way you interact with this UI is you again start on the top, you select your work friends, your school buddies, and so on. You go down into the list, you select two or three of your friends, and now to go down out of the list into your buttons, you have to scroll through the entire list of friends. It gets really old. It's not a problem when you develop the app and you only have two or three dummy friends in there. The first time you use it with 200 friends, it's virtually not usable. And the reason those layouts happen is because on a, uh, on a tablet, it's super, super simple. You can just fling through the list of friends. And when you're done flinging through the friends, you can just tap on one of the buttons. And yes, it is D-pad navigable in most cases, but it's just not a good experience. So some of the examples, as I said, um, you can do some pretty complex stuff with this. So this is, um, yeah, you can barely see it shining through. This is our TV and movies application. So in this example, you can see we structured the UI again where we have maybe the channels all the way on the left and then you have programs and then program information. And the nice thing for developers is you can actually use a lot of the Android uh, APIs and you can use, for example, fragments to make this easier. So all those different areas, different zones, you could implement as fragments. And bonus points, if you have a mobile app, you can just use the exact same fragments on your phone and tablet, and you can just reorganize them on your tablet. There is a whole lot of other um, design patterns that I don't really want to go into. As I said, this document is available for your designers. Um, they can study it. There is one other model which we use frequently, it's what we call content shelf. And so it's basically a row of containers and we use it in our TV and movies app. You can try it out on Google TV. We, what we do is when you actually go to the little scroll arrow all the way on the right, 
we open up a new view, we don't actually scroll this list. Because if we would scroll this list, it would be hard again to get back all the way to the left. So a couple of others, there is content grids, so you've already seen that earlier. Um, this is sort of the uh, slideshow, or I want to say, if you have a lot of thumbnails, there is content lists, and again, what I encourage you to do is basically don't just have the entire screen a list, but basically cut the list to whatever size is needed for your use case. You don't want to show lists all the way across. Cascading lists are difficult. I, I want to say they are almost evil. Um, I have not really gotten them right so that the focus behavior actually does exactly what I want at all given times. Because one of the things that happens frequently here is when I implement this, um, I switch focus between the two scrolling lists, and if they're scrolled out of sync, then focus jumps around or the lists reorient. So if you are really good with Android layout management, this is, this is something you can get working. Um, write a blog post about it. There is extended details um, that's also a frequent pattern. Subsection patterns, this gets more complicated here. So what I recommend for this is make sure that when a user, that a user has an easy way to get back up to the top because if this green, uh, this yellow scrolling area is too big, um, it's gonna be very difficult for a user to get back up to the top. Sort filler, so this is if you have basically a search box on top. If your app looks like this, it's too complicated, honestly. So this is one of the patterns that our UI designers recommend if you have sort of a complex search query. This, to my opinion, uh, this is too much for an average casual TV application. So a little bit of math before we have lunch or dinner over in London. So I've shown this slide before. Um, I would just want to point out a, a couple things here. First of all, Google TV devices, as you've probably figured out by now, uh, for Android, in terms of um, the resource identifiers, we, we call them large screens. They're not extra large screens. Even though people always say, well, obviously this is much larger than my tablet or much larger than my phone. It, it must be a large screen, an extra large screen. But keep in mind, really, the distance, yeah. Keep in mind the distance to the uh, to the viewer, so they appear much smaller. So to the math here, what we said is okay. It's extra large, or it's a large screen, but it's extra high density. It's 320 dpi. If you divide the um, 1920 by the dpi relative to the 160, you'll end up with something like 960 by 540 screen resolution. So this is in DPs, in the display independent pixels. If you then go and do the same thing for the 720p, you'll end up with the same display independent pixels. So again, if you do the right thing uh, in Android and you use display independent pixels, um, you will end up with layouts that translate nicely between HD TVs with 1080p and 720p. Um, let's see. I think we're running a little bit late, so I'm just going to browse through this very quickly here. I've talked a lot about our left side navigation bar, and it comes in three different ways. Um, if you go to our code.google.com URL, uh, you can find sample code, you can download it, and you can actually use it for your app. It's, it comes in pretty handy when you want to do things that normally would go in an action bar. It has the same API as an action bar. So if you're familiar with action bar, you can use uh, our left side navigation bar. Also, if you want to learn about fragments, it uses UI fragments. It's, it's a nice little sample code to take a look at. That's what it looks like in the real world. So, yeah, one, one other advice is ship early, ship often and listen to your users and give them away for feedback. So this is more like for next week, when you leave here, you have an app, you uploaded it to market, uh, make sure you check your market feedback, and even better than that, use analytics. So you can use Google Analytics, and you can actually add, or you can get a lot of information about 
how users use your application. Um, there may be a lot of hidden things. I, I want to say, take a look. If people don't use parts of your application, either those parts are too difficult to find, or maybe for some reason people, you know, you need to either simplify them or you need to make it easier to find them. Great talk about analytics. Um, last year's I.O. talks have all been uploaded. So one thing I want to point out, um, I think several people here have asked or have run into the whole um, I.O. thread issue. So in Android, it's generally a good practice to not do any uh, network I.O. or any disk I.O. on the UI thread. Uh, unless you're doing anything special, assume you're always on the UI thread. So if you're called in your callback methods, you are on the UI thread. Um, if you don't want to be on the UI thread, you have to start your own thread. There's great ways to do that. Things like async tasks or Java has a thread pooling classes. You can use the Java executor patterns. Um, if on Google TV or basically any Honeycomb device, if you do do I/O on the I/O uh, on the UI thread, it will actually uh, first of all it will lock and then it will fail. And this is really to remind you and to not do it as a developer. So we've had a bunch of people who run into this problem. Um, I think we've had some questions. If things fail while you're doing network access, double check if you're doing the network access on the UI thread. And for development mode, I would actually explicitly enable strict mode just to make sure you don't accidentally do UI, uh, I.O. on the UI thread. Yeah, be usable, be easy to learn, all the usual stuff. My favorite one is um, I have actually tested a lot of Google TV applications, and my favorite one of them, they actually seriously had a shortcut with keyboard shortcuts and Control S, Control B, and they had a little on-screen help. If I need to learn keyboard shortcuts to use your app, you're seriously doing it wrong. <laughs> um, this is not VI or Emacs. Um, this, it should be super easy. If any instructions are required, um, you're seriously doing it wrong. There is a lot of ways to differentiate. The most, uh, most impressive one is really good topography, good color, um, have good layouts, and use some animations and stuff. Lastly, keep our UI designers in business. Um, interaction design is a profession. It's really amazing what those guys can do. I am a coder. I'm not a UI designer. Um, I, I am constantly impressed how much value it actually adds to have great UI. Um, yeah, don't just port your UI over from another app. If, if your app looks like a phone app or if your app looks like yeah, any other platform app, it, it just doesn't feel at home. There is a lot of discussion. I, we had this recently with uh, things like Instagram, for example, is one, of, one, prominent, one prominent example where they really wanted to make sure that people have a great, consistent experience across different applications and across iPhone and across Android and everything. But think about how many people use your app on different platforms versus how many people use a lot of different Android apps and your app sticks out like a sore thumb. So I think, personally, I think it's more important to be consistent with the platform than be consistent with your own app on a different platform. Because if somebody uses your own app on different platforms, they're usually hardcore nerds anyway. I, mean, I, I don't know many people who carry more than one phone other than me. Everybody else in the room, of course. But. And uh, yeah. If your application shows any of those dialogues, users are usually annoyed. So be responsive. Yes, yes, yes. Don't block the UI thread. And more information. You can find a lot more information about uh, Google TV on our developers page. So there's developers.google.com slash TV. And then from there, there's links to basically everything else. Normally, when you go home again next week, the best way to get uh, hold of us and to get hold of uh, technical information is go to Stack Overflow. Um, it's really the best place to ask anything that's technically related to Google TV. So with that, did we actually get London to join us live? Yes.
Awesome. Hey London. Say hi to London. So I think that's the end of my talk. Um, I think. Do we want to? Who's next, actually? Osama. Osama. Okay. Osama, do you want to call into the hangout, or actually, we have a question in the room. Do you have more information about this thing you mentioned called Android U? Because I've done a search and I'm finding things that are clearly not what you were talking. Let me repeat the question. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll send. I can send out a link to David. In a second. Yes. Um, so the question was, where can I find this Android U thing you keep talking about? Um, so it was just launched. I don't know what the external name for it is. It was Android U internally. <laughs> uh, Osama said it's called Android Training. So it's uh, it's on our developers site. So it's developer.android.com, and probably click on Training. Uh, I will send a link to. I actually will send a link with all this stuff here and the Android Training to uh, David, so he can send it out to everyone. And I'll also share it on our Google TV site, on our Google TV Developer Plus page. OK. Um, so that's, OK. So Osama is just going to keep presenting on my laptop, so you guys can just stay in the Hangout. We'll just keep going from here. So the question from London was, since uh, web views don't support flash object, what's the recommended way to do uh, flash in web views? There really is no good way to do it. The only, the only runtime on Google TV that supports flash is Chrome browser. So what you can do is you can launch a Chrome browser, and in the Chrome browser you can render a flash player. But it's not going to be a very seamless experience. speakers now, Kevin. Awesome. You're speaking ah, to great. the crowd. So the question was about uh, which webcams are available. The short answer is none. Long answer is more difficult. Uh, so there is a webcam that people can plug into a Logitech review. The problem with that is um, it's uh, Logitech proprietary. So you will not be able to um, write apps that actually access it easily. Um, boils down to a lot of things like hardware performance and so on. But what's, what's possible today and what I would recommend is there is a bunch of webcams which actually use, um, use IP. And so there is IP-based webcams. I've seen some of the apps that actually use that. So maybe that's an alternative. There is one called Minicam, I think. Oh, well, okay. I'll ask it. I kind of know the answer, but I'll ask the question. It's, uh, is, it, is it going to be possible ever to use the N NDK? Ever is a really long time. <laughs> so, one of the tips, uh, if you guys miss uh, C programming so much that you just can't live without C programming anymore, the good news is uh, you can use render script. So, in render script, you can implement some neat little hacks. It's not the same as NDK. Uh, I realize that. Um, NDK is currently not available to developers simply because 
The current devices are x86 based, the future generation will be ARM based. Uh, there is a bunch of API differences on top of this. So we don't typically, uh, we don't typically have native code applications on there. marketing and business development person. So technically speaking, it's for this hackathon, I would say just fork the hell out of your code and just make it work on Google TV um, and sort of kind of get it working. The, the advantage of having one application in the Play Store is that your ratings transfer. So if you have half a million downloads on mobile, then it will show up on top of your Google TV list. If you have five stars on mobile, it will show up on top. If your Google TV application, for some reason, does not work very well, then of course the negative rating will also drag down your mobile rating. So it sort of goes both ways. I think for some people it makes a lot of sense if you have a consistent application and you have one listing for it. But I think it's a case-to-case -case basis, and I've also seen a lot of people who just have a Google TV optimized market listing. And I think it goes a little bit like for tablets, where if people see two applications and one calls out specifically Google TV, they have maybe more confidence that this one actually is optimized for it. So I think it, it's not a technical answer, it's really what's your marketing strategy, how do you want to position this? Okay, Christian, by the way, your email's on screen. Did you know that? Um, oh, awesome. No, I did not know that. Okay. Um, so, uh, there's been a lot of interest in uh, the, the remoting technologies, the Anymotes, and um, I think there must be like three teams doing stuff with Anymote here. Um, and so, Maybe you could you speak about anything that you've seen done with it, anything to be aware of uh, in the Anymote protocol? Could you speak of anything about that? So I have not worked with the Anymote library, so Paul was actually going to speak in about I don't know, a half hour, hour or so. He is an expert in Anymote, he has worked with it a little bit more. I think the best use case or the best use of Anymote that I've seen so far uh, is really for uh, what Leon has done with his, uh, I, I mentioned the name of it earlier, it's not an animal, Able Remote. So the app is called Able Remote. He's doing an awesome job with the libraries. It's of course still a remote control. If somebody wants to use the uh, any mode library to do things like multiplayer games or something, that would be a completely interesting use case. Uh, I have not experimented with that. But you can, maybe you can ask that question later when we have Paul, he's running around, he's actually talking to somebody outside. He's going to be on stage later. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll tell people to come back out later. Uh, just so you know, there's lots of people downstairs, and it's a bit hard to pull them away from acting. That's great. Don't pull them away from hacking. We just distract everyone here. Okay. Right. Well, thanks a lot. That's that's good. So maybe I'll just give you a quick audience view here. So we have a bunch of people hacking here as well. So if Sean actually gets us to the audience quickly, this I'll. Uh, I guess I can walk downstairs. I can show you everyone working downstairs and, you can, and everyone can see the Google Campus down here as well, it's quite cool. You know, we can do that maybe later. Let's just go through the talks now and then <laughs> later we'll just leave We'll just leave the connection open here. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, well thanks a lot. You're welcome. <laughs>